Good evening, everyone. It is Saturday, November the 16th, 2019. It is currently 8.05 p.m. Central Time. And I'd like to welcome you to a live broadcast. Thank you very much for listening. If you don't hear us live and you hear us um, on a recording of this live broadcast and you would like to be able to listen to us when we're actually live and keep up with everything else that we produce and everything else that we upload, all you need to do is go to the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. Apple App Store, the Google Play Store. Do a search for Spreaker. That is spelled S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R. Spreaker, download the app. Once you have the app downloaded, do a search for VBC, which stands for Victory Baptist Church. You should be able to easily find us and follow and like and do everything else that you need to do to keep up with everything we're doing on Spreaker. That's the best way to keep up with us right now. We'll have more details coming hopefully on Monday about all the situations related to our church app, and we'll be talking about that more as we get there. But I didn't hit the go live button to talk about that, but I do want to at least let people know uh, to get the Spreaker app because that's what we're using and that's our our plan A right now. And we will see if, uh, if how we're going to advance going forward. But let's advance this live broadcast, right? Let's advance this live broadcast. What do we want to talk about tonight? Well, what we want to talk about tonight is a Greek word, monte tes. Mate tes. What is that? Mate tes. It comes from a Greek word, monthano. All right. Mate tes and monthano. All right. What would mate tes and, 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 and I think it's monthano, manthano. Monthano, I think is the right way to pronounce it. But mate tes and monthano, these two Greek words, well, they're very important because they lead us to a discussion that we have been having at Victory Baptist Church for a long time. We've mentioned it over and over and over again. And we've even been doing kind of a mini-series in regards to this subject as well. So Mate Tes and Manthano are going to be two Greek words that we need to become very familiar with and spend a little time talking about this evening. All right, so let me give you the Greek words again. Mate Tes and Manthano. Mate tes and manthano. Mate tes. A mate tes is uh, in the Strong's Concordance 3101. 3101. Mate tes. And manthano is 3129 in the Strong's Concordance. Or if you want to look it up in the Blue Letter Bible, you can as well. Mate tes and manthano. These are two very important Greek words. Now, let's set this up. We have, I have brought up this controversy, um, and I don't know how big the controversy really is in 2019. I don't, I don't think it's much of a controversy anymore. I don't even think people give it much thought, but it is something that you definitely should think about and consider. And, and let me, let me state kind of the controversy, and then we'll look at these two Greek words and see if it offers a solution to the controversy. All right. Does that make sense? So, so let's do this. Let's work on this tonight. All right, it's Saturday evening. I'm sitting here in my study, and I thought, well, you know what? I'm I'm doing a little work on these two Greek words, so why not just grab the iPad real quick and go live? All right, it's it's nothing planned out. It's not I know not all well organized, but it's just organic and real. And I hope that there are people who appreciate this approach. All right, here we go. Over time. All right, let me, let me, let me, let's do a history lesson. Okay, all right, let's, let's go back in and let's have story time with me. All right, or we're going to go back in time. When I first became a Christian, all right, I had a certain idea of what Christians should be like and what Christianity should be like. Now, I, I wasn't brought up in a Christian upbringing, a Christian home or anything like that. So my, my understanding of Christianity was all kind of messed up. So when I became a Christian, I'm like, okay, there is a God. I am a sinner. He sent his son to die for me, a sinner. And there is forgiveness. And then the very first night I became a Christian, the pastor handed me a Bible and said, this is the word of God. He may have said, this is the inspired word of God. And he handed me a Bible and I was like, wow, he gave me his word and written for, I'm going to read every single word. I went home, stayed up all night, read the entire New Testament, started reading it, reading it, reading it, reading it. And I 
had this impression that everyone in church would be excited about the scriptures and they would want to talk about all of these things that are in the Bible and talk about what we should believe and talk about doctrine and, and like there would be this passionate hunger for God and everyone would be excited. And I didn't really quite experience that. So at times it made me start questioning, well, wait a minute, what should the Christian life really look like? Should it just be, well, you know, try to be a good person, you know, you don't do drugs, don't get drunk, you know, you don't, don't have, you know, uh, sexual sins of different kinds, you know, don't be a homosexual, don't get an abortion, you know, and then I kind of heard that, well, you're not supposed to listen to certain kind of music or watch certain kind of movies. So I kind of, basically what I started kind of discover is just kind of be a moral person, go to church, Maybe, you know, you don't even really have to go to every service, but, you know, show up and, but you're not really like thinking about the Bible, hunger for the, hungry for the Bible. You know, it's, it's just, you're just kind of, you just kind of believe this thing about God and you just kind of live your life. And I was like, okay, wait, is that what a Christian is? Or should a Christian be something more? There should be some kind of like excitement and passion and commitment and hunger and pursuing, what should it look like? And, and I was a little perplexed trying to figure out exactly what a Christian is or what a Christian isn't, what, what makes one a Christian, what should a Christian look like? And then I started learning about this term, discipleship, discipleship. And our church had discipleship training. I think it was like 5 p.m. on Sunday evenings. And I went, and well, I was the only one there, okay? And I was like, wait, what is going, wait, shouldn't everyone want to have discipleship training? And then I started buying, you know, seeing all these books about discipleship, discipleship, you know, you know, uh, a one-year course in discipleship, and I would read all these, and, and, and there were very, very common themes in all of the books about discipleship. A disciple, you know, is someone who follows Jesus Christ, and a disciple, if you're going to be a disciple, you'll have a daily quiet time, you'll study the Bible, you'll You'll pray, you know, and, and, and all these things. And I'm like, okay, so wait, a lot of the people I go to church with, they don't seem very interested in any of these things. That This doesn't seem to be a normal part of their life. So, so is, is a Christian a disciple or can you be a Christian and not a disciple? What, what's going on? And then at some point I stumbled upon the gospel according to Jesus by John MacArthur. Oh, wow. Now, some would say this was a good thing. Some would say this is a bad thing. But my perception greatly changed because MacArthur basically said, hey, if you're a Christian, you're a disciple because Christian and disciple, they're the same thing. And if you're not living a life showing that you're dedicated to Jesus Christ as Lord and you're living as a disciple and you're forsaking everything, taking up your cross, dying to yourself, following him. In other words, if you are a Christian, your life will look a certain way. And if it isn't, there is a very good chance that you never truly surrendered your Christ to, to your life to Christ the Lord. And you're probably a fake Christian. You, you are a, a professor, but you do not possess. You profess Christ, but you do not possess Christ. And, you know, and then he would say, you know, here are the marks of a true Christian. Here are the marks of a true disciple because disciple and Christian is a same thing. And then he would go to those verses, like, if you don't do this, you're, tr you're not my disciple. And, and so then I was like, okay, this is, this is the way I understand Christianity. Okay, you're not a Christian, 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 you're not a Christian. I'm the only Christian, okay? And then I'm like, well, wait a minute. That, this was difficult. And, and I kind of pursued that line of reasoning for a good portion of my Christian life. It's just kind of like, okay. Those people don't seem to be excited about God. They don't care about God. They don't seem to want to study the Bible, read the Bible. They're not passionate about the things of God. They don't want to talk about the things of God. Okay. And so you start thinking, well, wait a minute. Who is actually saved? And you're like, well, you know, the road to eternal life is narrow. Few be that find it. So there are only going to be a few people. So then you start thinking in every church you go to, you're like, well, I guess majority of the church is not saved. And I started struggling with these concepts. And continue on. When I, and then especially over the last year at Victory Baptist Church, we've, we've really started trying to understand how does that view, right? Kind of the Lordship kind of view. How does that view really fit in with the idea of that we're justified by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone, right? 
And, and the way it's typically explained is, it makes perfect sense. You are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. But the faith that saves you will change you. All right, so you're not saved by doing good works. You're not saved by doing all of these things. But if you don't do all of these things, you're not saved. So in other words, you have to do these things. And they say, well, because yes, salvation will do this. And I'm kind of like, well, we're, we're kind of walking in circles. You're saying I don't have to do all of these things to be saved. But you're telling me if I don't do all of these things, I'm not saved. So how does this fit in with the idea of justification is a legal declaration where I'm declared just and God and the righteousness of Christ is accredited to my account and my standing before God is purely based on an alien foreign righteousness that was given to me has nothing to do with what I do. But then they come along and say, yeah, it does have something to do with what you do because what you do proves whether you are truly justified or not. I'm like, wait a minute. Now my works prove my justification? That seems like... that it, you, Justification is a legal declaration where I'm declared righteous because of the work of Christ. The works that would prove my justification would be the works of Christ, not my works. So you're talking about works that prove my sanctification. So how does this... And I, again, I, I'm, I could re-preach all the things that we've been talking about literally for it seems like a year at Victory Baptist Church. And they raised some questions. So this started making me think, okay, wait a minute. How do we understand this idea? Now, now we get into an idea, how do we understand works? How do we understand salvation by grace? But in the middle of all of that, this underlying concept, okay, can a person be a Christian, but not a disciple and become a disciple later? Now, all disciples will be Christians, but not all Christians will be disciples. Discipleship, becoming a disciple, is another step in the Christian walk. First, there is conversion, right? And then you can be, and First Corinthians seems to kind of support this idea. You had people at Corinth that Paul seemed to refer to as Christians, yet he referred to them as carnal, he tried to refer to them at times, if you take Hebrews and 1 Corinthians, you get this idea that, hey, you're you're still, you know, in infancy. You're, you're, I can't even give you strong meat. I can't even give you meat. I have to give you milk. I have to teach you the first principles over and over again. You're carnal. You're not acting the way you're supposed to act. Now, that would seem to indicate that there can be salvation, yet not the level where you're supposed to be. Now, if that's true, are they disciples? Or are they simply Christians, newborn babes that are growing and hopefully will mature and step into discipleship? Are they two separate things? Now, you can get books that will say they're two separate things. You can get books by people who will say, no, absolutely not. They're the same thing. My argument to all of, to those who say they're the same thing, if that's your argument, you have to take it to its logical conclusion. When I read scriptures that say, if you don't take up your cross and deny yourself, you're not my disciple, then you're basically saying, hey, unless you take up your cross and deny yourself, you're not a disciple of Christ. You're going to be saying basically a large portion of professing Christianity are not saved. And if you're honest with yourself, you're going to look in the mirror and go, wait a minute. Am I really dead to self? Am I really denied? Now you, and then people will come up, well, it's not saying you'll do it perfectly. Okay, so now you're going to back up the requirement. Jesus says, if you don't do this, you're not my disciple. You're going to say that is a requirement, that being a disciple is a Christian. But then you're going to say, well, you don't have to do it perfectly. Okay, well then, so how, does, how perfectly do I have to do it to truly be a disciple where I can truly be a Christian? I have to do it only 50%, 60%? Like, these are real questions because you're dealing with you're deal dealing with eternal salvation, eternal life. You're dealing with someone's assurance. So these are important questions. Now, I say all of that to get back to the Greek word, the two Greek words, matetes and montheno, or manthano, all right? Matetes and manthano. Now, matetes, Again, the Greek, it's in the Strong's Concordance 3101. If you look, I believe at Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, I believe that's the first place in the New Testament this Greek word matete shows up. I could be wrong. That's just from memory. 
And if you and if you look up the interlinear, you'll get to the Greek word. I'm going to just give us some a little information about this Greek word and listen to the argument made by a a a words a Greek word study here. Now some may come back and argue against this, but at least get one perspective. All right, here we go. Disciple. That's the word the in in English. Disciple. The Greek word is matetes. Um, it means it, and this is uh, according to one source. This word means more than is commonly thought. While it comes from uh, Manthano, which is uh, 3129 in the Strong's Concordance, which means to teach, Montetes means more than just being a student or a learner. Manthano, in fact, is really comparable to the idea a full and thorough knowledge. So they're arguing that Monte Tace, the word disciple, it means more than just being a student or a learner. Just being a student and a learner, they say, is not an adequate definition of that Greek word, Monte Tace. Now, just keep that in mind. So that means if, if, if we're going to make these synonymous, then being a Christian is more than just being a student and a learner. It requires more than just being a student and a learner. Now, I would have to raise my hand at this point and go, wait a minute. I know a lot of Christians who rarely study the Bible. I mean, we've got all kinds of surveys. They don't study the Bible. Many don't read it on a daily and regular consistent basis. If they're not even, re- if they're not even reading and studying the Bible on a regular consistent basis, can we even call them a student or a learner? And if Monte Taste goes even beyond a student and a learner, showing up to church once a week, does that make you a student and a learner? You know, that, these, these are important questions. Let's, let's go back here to the study here. All right, so uh, Mont- Montetes comes from uh, Montano, uh, which gives the idea of full and thorough knowledge. In classical Greek, Montetes is what we would call an apprentice. One who, would not, uh, not, one who not only learns facts from the teacher, but other things such as his attitudes and philosophies. In this way, the the Montetes was what we might call a student companion who doesn't just sit in class listening to lectures, but rather who follows, uh, who, um, who follows, now, um, they had, so no, just go right here. So they, they want to take Monte Taste and move it to a student companion, a student companion who is doing more than just listening, doing more than just learning. They are, they are, they are learning a, about attitude, philosophy. They are, they are, uh, they are, but they, not, they do more than just learning. They're one who follows. While the same basic idea is present in New Testament uses, usage, Monte Taste goes even deeper, um, deeper. Interestingly, while it appears over 260 times, those occurrences are only in the gospel and acts. It pictures total attachment to the Lord, a connection that goes even further than the idea of an apprentice. Being a disciple of Christ means that we are, like the 12 disciples were, with him night and day, day in and day out. Being his disciple means that we are true followers, true believers, imitating all that he does and quoting all he says. Wow. Okay, now let's just stop right there. Mate Taste goes beyond an apprentice. It's a follower. It's someone, we're like the 12 disciples. We are with him day in, day out, morning, afternoon, evening, night. We're learning what he says. We follow him. We quote everything he says. We try to follow everything he does. Mate Taste gives the idea of a high. I'm not, not, I think that's not even a fair way of saying it. The Greek word mate Taste, especially how it's used in classical Greek, seems to give the idea, now this is very important, of total commitment. Total commitment. 
not part-time commitment, total commitment. Now, this, this is very, I, I, I have some connection with this word. Um, and I was in martial arts good portion of my life. And in, in some martial arts, especially those who are very traditional and speak of some classic, um, classic martial arts ideas, and, and, many, and, and some of the martial arts schools I went to, they'd give you books you have to read and you had to take tests um, because you, you were learning not just, you were to learn more than just the physical ability in martial arts to kick and punch and, and do you know, all those things, but you were to learn about a, a philosophy, a way of life, an idea, a culture, history. And uh, they, would, they would talk many times about how martial arts students would basically take on this idea of a disciple. They would submit themselves to a teacher to learn all that he could teach them, not just about how to punch and kick, but how to think, how to view life. And it was a total commitment. And so many times martial arts teachers were like, some of you are here just to learn how to kick and punch. You don't truly want to become a martial artist. You don't truly want... Some of you here will be true disciples, truly committed. You're going to be here every time the door is open. And you're not just going to learn what happens here. You're going to go home and you're going to work on your technique over and over and over again. I don't know how many times in martial arts I would hear it. 20% of the learning happens here in, in class. The 80% happens at home. You better be dedicated. And if you came back and your technique wasn't better, the martial, the martial arts instructor would say, you're not committed. You're not being a true martial artist. Now, it's just funny that that's how that you're paying. You're going to martial arts and paying them. And then they're getting in your face yelling that you're not committed enough. In church, we don't do that. We don't do it. No, 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 you know, no. No, nobody's going to get in anybody's face. It's perfectly okay. But Monte Tace, now I just want to make sure we understand this. Monte Tace is speaking of a high level of commitment, total commitment. Now, if that's the case, and we connect it with being a Christian, guess what we just did? Only those who demonstrate total commitment to Christ are true believers. Anything less is fake, is fake fraudulent, is a fake professor in Christ. Now that's a serious claim. And we, we'd have to think about that carefully. Let's go back to this. All right. And let me read this again, because I think this is important. While, while the same basic idea present in the New Testament usage, Monte Tais goes even deeper, uh, deeper. Interestingly, it, interestingly, while it appears over 260 times, those occurrences are only in the Gospels and Acts. It pictures total attachment to the Lord Jesus, a connection that goes even further than the idea of an apprentice. Being a disciple of Christ means that we are, like the 12 disciples were, with him night and day, day in and day out. Being his disciple means that we are true followers, true believers, imitate, imitating all that he does and quoting all that he says. Now that's very important, right? I think that's something we have to really, really think about here. Right now, I'm looking at something here because I think this is important. Um, they talk about the, the idea of the connection between mate taste and being a Christian um, and a committed disciple. The idea is, uh, and, and, and and this is very important. Um, some, give me one second here. I'm trying to find. Okay, here we go. While some teachers make a distinction between a Christian and a committed disciple. Now, that's, that's true. Within Christianity, some teachers make a distinction between a Christian and a committed disciple. Now, let me stop right here. This is very important, all right? Because uh, I really want to drive this point home. The reason some people make that distinction is because if they did not make that distinction, they would look at a whole lot of people who profess to be Christians and say, give me a break. You're not totally committed. You're not following him day and night. You're not quoting everything he says, imitating everything he does. You're not, you're not, no, 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 no. So stop claiming it. 
And so then you would basically be telling 90% of professing Christians, hey, you can't have no assurance of your salvation because you're not truly a disciple. Now that raises serious questions and, and, and how to handle that. And some, and some teachers have just basically said, well, wait a minute, um, there, there's got to be a, a, there's got to be a difference here. There's got to be um, a, 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 a there, there's got to be some kind of a distinction between the two. There has to be. You have you have Christians who sometimes tend to be carnal and they they're like babies and they 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 can't handle strong meat. They don't understand. They do they make you know. And you're like okay. That, that And then you've got others who are growing or are passionate. And you're like, well, wait a minute. There's a distinction here. Now, some will just say the distinction is between um, spiritual maturity versus spiritual infancy. But wouldn't there, if, if there's a difference between spiritual infancy and spiritual maturity, wouldn't that difference, I mean, wouldn't you have to draw a distinction on what discipleship looks like? Wouldn't you have, I mean, wouldn't you have to at least raise that question? I, I, I think so. Or at least I think so. All right, let me go back here. Uh, While some teachers make a distinction between a Christian and a committed disciple, that idea is a modern invention and is foreign to Scripture. They say drawing a distinction between the two is a modern day invention. Uh, they argue that the terms Christian and disciple are clearly synonymous. All right. Now, they give a couple of scriptures here. We won't read them right now, but at some point we will work on this in greater detail. I'm just going to throw this out there for now. This is what I'll do. I'll give you the references for you to look up. Here are the references they give. Now, they don't they don't have them written out, which always causes me to question, okay, we better look these up to make sure. If you are listening to some of my Sunday school lessons, I always point this out when books do this. But, you know, in a Greek word study, you would think that they would, did a pretty good job, but who, who knows? Here are the passages they give. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. Acts chapter 6, verse 7. Acts chapter 11, verse 26. Acts chapter 14, verse 20. Acts chapter 14, verse 22. And Acts chapter 15, verse 22. All right. We'll get back to those in just a second. All right. I just want to, I got to make sure I click back to my, um, the app that allows me to go live and make sure it doesn't disconnect when I'm away from it. All right. Let's give these passages of scripture again. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. Acts chapter 6, verse 7, Acts chapter 11, verse 26, Acts chapter 14, verse 20, Acts chapter 14, verse 22, and Acts chapter 15, verse 10. All right, I'll say those one more time for everyone's benefit. Please write these down and look them up. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 2, Acts chapter 6, verse 7, Acts chapter 11, verse 26, Acts chapter 14, verse 20, Acts chapter 14, verse 22, and Acts chapter 15, verse 10. Now, they make an argument that in Scripture, Christian and disciple are synonymous. So, to be a disciple, this this total commitment is the same thing as being a Christian. And if you don't have the... You you can't be a Christian and not a disciple. So, So, you've got to be truly committed like this or your Christianity is called into question. Now, again, I would tell you to go through all... Through all the New Testament and look at any time Jesus said, you can't, be a, uh, you, can't, you can't be my disciple unless you do this, 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 this. Write out the list of all the things you're supposed to do to be a disciple and then ask yourself, do you do those things? And if you're not do those things, you're not a disciple. And if not being a disciple means you're not being a Christian, you're not a Christian. Yeah, I would argue then how are the people in 1 Corinthians um, who are carnal and all the things they are, how were they Christians? Right. Some very important questions, right? Now, many... Um, I think MacArthur takes the same stance, and I know I went to one one uh, Bible college I went to took the same stance that there are no such thing as carnal Christians. They're, so when Paul refers to those being carnal in Corinth, they're not they're not saved. That raises some serious questions. Sorry, that this study goes on to say this: one of the many significant occurrences of Matetes is its first appearance. 
And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was, when he was set, his disciples came un, unto him and he opened his mouth and taught them. All right, so they're saying the first uh, appearance of the Greek word matetes is in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. All right, um, that's interesting. Yeah, okay, I, I think I see why. Uh, because if you look up the word disciple, uh, uh, in Matthew 5, it uses disciples, the plural. So, all right, I can see, see why. Depending on how you look it up in the Blue Letter Bible, you probably have to go further down where it shows you where all the Greek words you, are used. So we, well, we could talk about that in greater detail. But Matthew chapter 5, all right. Now, what follows this idea where uh, he, he, his disciples came unto him and he opened his mouth what follows in chapters 5 through 7 of Matthew chapter 5, of course, has been called the Sermon on the Mount. Its, its first outstanding feature is that it's addressed not to the multitude, but to disciples, true believers. It does not deal with salvation, but with how the true follower of Christ lives. From that time on, the disciples could not only remember the words Jesus spoke, but they would also see those words lived out in his life. Now, listen very carefully. Matthew chapter 5. This is the beginning of the word matetes. And they're making an argument that if you read Matthew 5 to uh, Matthew 7, all right, all of those chapters, what you're going to see is that is what's required to be a disciple. That is how a disciple should live. Now, I will argue if we go through Matthew 5, Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, and Matthew chapter 7, and we say, okay, if I don't do this, I'm, I'm not a disciple, I'm not a Christian, I think you're going you're gonna to pause and go, wait a minute here. If I look at these chapters, I don't know if I'm truly saved. Love your enemy. Turn the other cheek. Look at all some of those things. If a, I mean, the, the Matthew five takes the the external law and says it has to be, and an, an, it's and it has an internal application as well. So if you even look at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. By the time you read Matthew chapter five to Matthew chapter seven, you're going to realize you're a murderer, you're an adulterer, you are a liar, and you're and you're you're condemned. Now I, I I won't argue that this is not this is not the standard that we are to pursue, but you're going to find yourself not living up to it. Well, if this is the standard to be a disciple, then I'm never going to truly live up to the standard of a disciple. And you say, well, of course not. Yeah, no one's going to live up to the standard perfectly. Okay, if no one lives up to the standard perfectly, then how do you how do you decide who is and who isn't a disciple? You see, it gets to the, the whole test idea that we've talked about at Victory Baptist Church. You know, MacArthur does the same thing. Here are the tests. How do you know you're a Christian? Here's the test. You got to pass this test. And all this test is about things you do. You got to do this. You can't do this. You got to do this. And then, okay, and then everyone will say, well, no one's going to pass the test perfectly. Okay, well, then how do you grade the test? If Matthew 5 through 7 is telling me how a disciple lives and I, and I fall short of that, can I still call myself a disciple? So now you're saying being a Christian is not just believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's believing and doing all the things in Matthew 5 through 7. Then you're a disciple. Then you're a true believer. Don't you see a possible problem with that? And I, I hear all the trying to work around the problem. I, to me, couldn't it be easier that, yes, you can become a Christian, you place your faith in Christ, and that should mean that you're going to live a life dedicated and committed, but, but you may not. And in the meantime, there, there's this uh, other thing called being a disciple. It Doesn't separating it at least make it a little easier to try to work around? I don't know. I don't know, but let's go back to this, all right? It's, it's some interesting information here, right? So uh, they go, uh, so the Sermon on the Mount, it, the first outstanding of the Sermon on the Mount, or the first uh, outstanding feature of the Sermon on the Mount is that it's, it's, it's addressed not to the multitude, but to, to disciples, true believers. It does not deal with salvation, but with how true followers of Christ lives. From that time on, the disciples would not only remember the words Jesus spoke, but they would also see those words lived out in his life. At the opposite end of our Lord's earthly ministry, we see the verb from the Great Commission. He gave to his disciples, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Teach is um, uh, matheo, ma matheteo. 
So the disciples are now making disciples of others who in turn make other disciples. That is indeed our commission. Now, I'm going to stop right here because they kind of leave something out in the Great Commission. All right. Now, I, I, there's one, one paragraph left here, but I'm going to back up because I'm going to call, I'm going to, I'm going to throw a red flag here, a challenge flag. Well, wait a minute. Let's look at the Great Commission carefully. Right? Go, therefore, and teach. You have the first teaching. Right? You teach. Then you baptize. This leads many to, to speculate, and I think rightly so. The first teaching there, the first command in the Great Commission is evangelism. You're going and teaching them there is a God, you are a sinner, you cannot fulfill God's holy demands. However, he sent his son not only to keep the law on behalf of you who cannot keep the law, but to die for you. And in you know, justification, you teach them to put their faith in Jesus Christ and they will be saved. Then you baptize, bring them into the church. Then you have a second command to teach, to teach them to obey now, I will argue that, that if you look at that carefully, you could make an argument, yes, you first teach them to believe, place their trust and faith in Christ. You then baptize. Then you teach them to obey. Now, if we do this in a logical way, the first teaching is evangelism. They make a profession of faith. You, you treat them as a Christian. You baptize, you baptize them, treating them as a believer. And then you teach them and that and that, ne- that that teaching to teach them to obey that's discipleship now you're calling them to discipleship you've called them to faith you've called them to believe you've called them to trust you've baptized them you bring them into the church and now discipleship begins they almost they, the way they want to describe it is it's synonymous so hey you teach and you, te- and you teach to make disciples. And, and I, so I guess you got to make them disciples before you baptize them. But I mean, like, I, I, don't think, I don't know if we really think this out. I know we don't want a, we don't want a watered down, cheap grace that just gives people to say, oh, I believe in Jesus and live any way they want. I understand we, we want to protect it. But we got to make sure that we don't go to to such a level in trying to protect, quote unquote, faith in Christ and the church that we almost create a works based system where we say, okay, you claim to be a Christian. Now, buddy, go out there and prove it. You got to prove you better prove it to me. All right. Matthew five through seven. You better start putting that all into practice. You better start obeying. You better start memorizing scripture. You better start reading. You better start doing this. You better. Okay, wait a minute. You're not showing the total commitment that matetes, the Greek word for disciple, seems to indicate. Mm, I don't really think you're a Christian. And then guess what your assurance is based on? Your assurance was based based off what you do, not what on Christ accomplished. I, I think there is an issue here. This is the last paragraph they get. And, and just I just think that when they, they talk about the Great Commission, uh, they, they, the mathet, matheteo, um, they, 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 they give a, the Greek word for teach here. I'd have to look up that Greek word to make sure I'm saying it right. Um, it's, in, it's in Greek, so I'm, I'm just guessing. Uh, so the disciples are now making disciples of others who in turn are making other disciples. I agree. We're supposed to be making disciples. We're supposed to be making disciples. But guess what? I can't make a Christian. Okay, right there, they're called, called to make disciples. I call, here's my job. I call and I preach the gospel. God has to make them a Christian. I can't. I can make them a disciple because now I can instruct them and challenge them on what a disciple is and teach them the path of discipleship. I cannot make them a Christian. So the fact that it says go and make disciples, um, I think the making of a disciple is the idea that I'm taking a Christian and now trying to lead them into discipleship. I, I think there's got to be some truth somewhere in that. This is what they, uh, they end. Over the next few days, read the Sermon on the Mount and be challenged with what it means to be Jesus' disciple, a true Christian. So that what they want everyone to do is read Matthew 5-7 through and go, that's what a true Christian is. Matthew 5 through 7, that is what a true Christian is. I challenge you over the next few days, read Matthew 5 through 7 and write down 
Everything in there that tells you to do this and don't do this and do this and don't do this. Write down the list. And then when you're done, look at that list. Count how many things you have. How many how many commands you're, you have to do this, don't do this, do this. And then say, okay, if you're going to be a Christian, here's the list. And don't tell me that doesn't cause you to pause and go, that doesn't sound like justification by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. Now, I know what some will say. Yes, we are saved by grace alone, and the grace that saves will produce people who will follow Matthew 5 through 7. Well, that sounds wonderful, but what you're just, even though it sounds wonderful, what you actually just said is if you're truly saved, you will do Matthew 5 through 7. If you don't, you're not. You just made it a requirement to do Matthew 5 through 7 in order to be saved. And you can try to you can try to reword it all day. That that's a problem. It this should cause a problem for everyone. Now, here's the thing: Is it possible? And I'm just going to throw this theory out there that the word disciple can have a general use, very general, right? Matetes, a learner, a follower, someone committed to Christ, just in a general sense that, that the term matetes can just refer to a Christian and it's just saying that a Christian is someone who's put their faith in Christ, they're going to be trying to follow him, they're going to be trying to learn about him, and it's just used as a general descriptive term. But matetes, a disciple, can also refer to someone who has entered into a path of discipleship, a deep level of commitment. Can it carry a general idea and in a more specialized way? So sometimes in the Bible, it can be used in a very uh, synonymous way. Christian and disciple, same thing. And then other times we have passages where Jesus is saying, you cannot be my disciple unless you do this, 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 and this. And then if we take that, then we're saying, well, no one can be a Christian unless they do those things. And I, I think maybe, can't there be possibly two concepts going on here at the same time? Montetes, disciple. Yeah. General term, synonymous with being a believer. Montetes, yeah. It also speaks of a deeper commitment of truly being a disciple. Someone on the path of true discipleship. I don't know if that works, but it's something I would bring up. Now, I would challenge you that I'm going to go back and just give you those scriptures they told us to read that they say makes it synonymous. I want to grab my Bible right now and look these up, but um, I won't do that because I wanted to make this quick. According to them, while some teachers make a distinction between a Christian and a committed disciple, that idea is a modern invention and is foreign to scripture. They are clearly anonymous. Now, I want you to know, they don't go to any of those scriptures. They don't have written down those scriptures where Jesus says, if you're truly my disciple, you'll do this. They don't have those scriptures down because that would indicate unless you do this, you're not truly a Christian. No, they, they give some other passages and here are the ones. I'm, I'm just going to give them to you again so that you can write them down and I want you to look them up for yourself. Acts chapter six, verses one through two. Acts chapter six, verse seven. Acts chapter 11, verse 26, Acts chapter 14, verse 20, Acts chapter 14, verse 22, and Acts chapter 15, verse 10. All right? So look those up and see, do they prove that disciple and Christian are basically used synonymous? And then I do challenge everyone to do this. According to them, Matthew 5 through Matthew 7, Matthew chapter 5 through Matthew chapter 7, this These chapters tell you what it truly means to be a disciple, what it truly means to be a Christian. And I want you to really do this. Grab a piece of paper, grab a notebook, start in Matthew 5. Read some verses and go, okay, this is what it means to truly be a Christian. This is what it it means. And if I don't do these things, I'm I'm not a Christian. In fact, I'll just grab my Bible right here just to show you. I'll just give you a hint of what to do. Everyone should do this, right? We, we, could spend, we could spend a couple of hours doing it right here in this recording. But let's give you an idea. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. And seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain. And when he was uh, set, he, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. All right, let's stop right here. All right, to truly be a disciple, 
To truly be a Christian, I have to be poor in spirit. So, and you just you start going through all these verses. Your list is going to get extremely long. So here's what's going to happen. Either you're going to have this list going, okay, here you got to do all these things or you're not truly saved, right? And if you look at that list, you're going to basically start questioning your own salvation. No one's going to have any assurance or you're going to do this. Well, this is a list that tr- shows you who truly are a disciple, who's truly a Christian. However, comma, no one's going to do this perfectly. And at that point, you kind of make the list irrelevant. I mean, this is what you're supposed to do, but no one's going to do it perfectly, so don't worry about it. Well, wait a minute. Is it, is it the standard that shows me if I'm truly a Christian or isn't it? Or is it telling me how I should live? And by the time you get to the end of Matthew chapter 5, or you get to the end of Matthew chapter 7, all you can say is, Oh me, Lord Jesus, please save me. I am a sinner. I am not worthy. I cannot live up to this standard. Now, in traditional Lutheran theology, they would look at Matthew 5 through 7 as law that condemns and, and it shows you your need of a savior. And you could not do all the things in Matthew 5 through 7, but Jesus did. That would be more of a, a traditional Lutheran approach. Something to think about. So the two Greek words tonight that we looked at, let me back up here, go back. I, 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 I hate when I kind of give that pause there because you can't see what's going on. But I'm doing the live broadcast on an iPad, and I have the notes, and so I have to click the home button to go back to the notes, and then click back to go back to the to the uh, the app that's allowing me to go live. So that so sometimes I have to wait, and when I go back, the screen closes and it opens back up. It, you just have to see it, so it sometimes causes it to like, man, what's he doing? I, I'm perfectly okay. And when sometimes when I was trying to read the screen, um, when you go, it was cutting off the top words. What I was trying to read, so at some part I was just trying to make, a, trying to remember what was there, and then finally I got it to open back up. So I was having uh, some a couple of problems there. So I apologize if it didn't come out perfectly, but that's okay. It's live; I can't do anything. If you're if you were sitting there watching me, I could show you. But okay, here here are the Greek words: matetes, which is Strong's three one zero one, and it comes from Mont- Montano, Montano. Um, which is uh, Strong's 3129, 3129. So, Manthano and Matetes. And, I'm, and I, I'm, I'm counting that I'm getting the pronunciation at least within the ballpark, right? I hope so. So, I, I just, I saw this Greek study, this Greek word study, and I thought I would share it with everyone. And because it just so relates to so much of what we've been talking about. We've been talking about discipleship. What is discipleship? What does it mean to be a disciple? We've been dealing with this issue. And now here's someone dealing with the issue by looking at the Greek word. They clearly have a perspective. They have a clear perspective. And just make sure you understand this. People can, when you're doing a Greek study, sometimes you can go to the Greek with your perspective already in mind and you make the meaning of the Greek word fit your perspective sometimes. And so what you have to do is, you know, I mean, they give you some basic definitions of the word, but I think if we look, in fact, let me look here real quick. We're going to get an echo. 